Welcome to the Food Junkies Podcast. Here, we aim to provide you with the experience, strength, and hope of professionals actively working on the front lines in the field of food addiction. The purpose of our show is to educate you, the listener, and increase overall awareness about food addiction as a disease with abstinence as the solution. Here, we talk about all things recovery. Most importantly, how to thrive rather than just survive. So stay positive, make a change for yourself, tell others about your change, and hopefully the message will spread. Welcome to the Food Junkies podcast. My name is Dr. Vera Tarman, and I am your host today, speaking with Julie Clark about bariatric surgery and the food addict. For those who may be addicted to food, what issues should be considered before taking the serious step of about having bariatric surgery? Or for individuals who have already taken that major step, how can they successfully address their food addiction and protect their overall health? Julie Clark trained as a food addiction coach through INFACT, otherwise known as the International School for Food Addiction Counseling and Treatment. She is also certified in holistic medicine for addiction, has trained in ketogenic eating for mental health, and is both certified and licensed to administer the comprehensive food addiction assessment tool known by its acronym, SUGAR. Through her private practice, Bariatric Breakthrough, Julie specializes in working with women and men who have had weight loss surgery or who are considering having it. She currently provides in-depth and highly personalized treatment on an individual basis. Her abstinence-based program focuses on low-carb, high healthy fat eating, targeted nutrient supplementation, emotional management, and vigilant self-defense against sabotaging thoughts. Julie herself had bariatric surgery 23 years ago and was nonetheless forced to confront the true nature of her problem, which was food addiction. With over a decade of stable recovery and a passion for helping others, she's maintaining a weight loss of more than 200 pounds at her ideal weight. Now, perhaps in a future podcast, we'll explore Julie Clark's additional career as a multi-award winning professional singer-songwriter and how she uses her musical talents to teach and help people with food addiction. Welcome, Julie. Thank you so much, Vera. Thank you so much for inviting me and for focusing some of your podcast's precious time on the population of people who have had bariatric surgery, who are in an an altered state, (laughs) Um, and the people that are thinking about it, because I think that there are some really serious concerns and special needs among that population. Absolutely. I'm, I'm really thrilled to be able to speak with you. We always begin with finding out about the person themselves. You mentioned that you had a history of bariatric surgery. So why don't you talk about a little bit about your days before bariatric surgery, why you decided to do it, and then uh, basically how you found food addiction afterwards. Okay, wonderful. I actually believe that I was born an addict with all the predisposition to have problems with food immediately. A little seven pound food addict right out of the gate. And that's because I could see that food was doing more for me than it was doing for the people around me. And that was always true for me. So really what ultimately led me to have bariatric surgery was my first 34 years of life being in active addiction and just progressively ballooning up to a weight of over 350 pounds. Actually, my scale at home didn't weigh any higher than 350. So I'm really honestly not sure how much higher than that weight I got. So as you can imagine, it's such a painful thing in our world to be, and especially back then, you know, back then, because I'm 57 now. So this was my young, my younger years when it really wasn't as common. The obesity problem that we have so common now was less common. And oh my God, I had such a target on my back all through things like brutal bullying at school and having it be really obvious that I was the problem, the the, the main problem in our family because of my eating and my weight. And throughout my young adulthood, no one was ever interested in me romantically or sexually. I was always outside looking in, just outside of the bounds of what anyone would risk being associated with or interested in. So like just a couple of low points to to tell you what it was like. When it came time for my college graduation, 
I had to buy two graduation gowns. I was not expecting to feel a little wave of emotion, but two graduation gowns and have them sewn into one. Oh, wow. And there was one time when I was walking on a city street with, I was crossing a city street with my boss and the president of the company that I worked for at the time and a car full of guys driving by mood at me in front of my boss and the president of the company, just things that make you want to disappear. And yes, there were diets along the way and lots of them were successful temporarily. There were two times that I lost more than a hundred pounds and I swore that I would never let myself gain it back, but I did. I couldn't seem to help it. So it came to the point where at 34 years old, I basically gave up on being willing to do it by myself. And I chose to have weight loss surgery. And for two years, things went really well, really well. It was exhilarating and amazing and wonderful. I was the poster child for doing everything that my doctor recommended that I do. And I was starting to feel good about myself for the first time ever and being able to move and enjoy life and those kinds of things. What type of surgery did you have and how much weight did you lose? I had Ruin Y gastric bypass surgery. Over the course of that two years, I lost 200 pounds. Wow. It took about a year and a quarter, actually, for most of the weight loss. So that's just mind-blowingly rapid, the incredible shrinking woman thing. And that part was incredibly positive. But the problem is that after that two-year period, which is really typical for when people start to have problems again, I started feeling compelled to eat again, drawn mainly to carbohydrates, things that were, uh, carbohydrates are all the sugars and all the starches. And whereas in that two-year period, I had been mostly not very, especially hungry and not having particularly strong cravings. That that two-year point is where that grace period ran out for me. And, and I started having the compulsion to eat more and more gradually. And the situation that I found myself in was that I couldn't fit the amount of food that I was compelled to eat in the reduced size stomach yeah. that I had. And so my brain was on fire to eat, but I couldn't hold it. And I would eat to the point of pain, real serious pain, to the point of being afraid that I might rip open Mm. the surgical suturing that had created that smaller stomach. It was awful and miserable and scary. And I'm compressing this into a small period of time. It took took time to play out. It got worse and worse gradually, but that was really the situation that developed for me was this sort of untenable situation. And that really led me to the aha moment that I know you're going to want to know about in terms of food addiction. When that light bulb went off for me, what was one night when I was in serious pain from having been binging, I, I was, you know, I guess I was trying to make myself throw up, but not because I I wanted to avoid gaining weight at that point. And I was never good at that. Even in all those dec- the decades before, I was never someone who could use that as that as a tool for keeping weight off. But at, in moments like this one, yeah. I was trying to make myself throw up for relief from real pain, serious pain. It just so happened that where I was in that moment of trying to throw up, I could see the binge foods that I hadn't finished eating yet. And I realized that if I was successful in getting myself to throw up, I knew that I was going to go back and keep eating those foods and return to that position of agony again. And I did, to be honest, I did. But I saw something right then. I saw something for the first time. It was like an epiphany for me that something in my brain was wired incorrectly, like wrong, terribly wrong. And that my brain thought 
that it that my my brain desperately wanted food and thought it was food that I needed, but it couldn't be food because food never satisfied the craving. It just never choose. It gave me enough relief to to have me chase along after it, but it never satisfied it. It was always out of reach of satisfaction. So that was really a turning point for me where I started to understand that it was an addiction. And I turned to 12-step support and started the long journey of learning about the addiction that I came to understand that I had, learning about my disease and what it was going to take to get well and stay well. And part of that journey was going back to school to study, to be what I call a carbohydrate addiction coach, a food addiction professional. And and it took a long time. It took a lot of years for me to understand the the foods that I couldn't tolerate and that were triggering me and to become willing to put them down. First of all, I want to say that what profound examples that the graduation dress and then the street scene about how awful it is to be obese and, and how we have learned how to not be racist and not be sexist and not be ageist to some degree, but we haven't learned how not to be, I guess, fat phobic. But how much did you uh, gain regain weight after when the food addiction took hold? You'd lost the 200 pounds. And by the time you had your epiphany and made changes, How much weight did you actually gain back? I only gained back about 40 pounds, but considering the restriction of my, to gain 40 pounds when you can't take in much food, that really represents a lot of pain, a lot of just miserable, painful, small binges that just were really scary and really painful. I guess if I'd been devoted to having like only what people call slider foods, like a milkshake or something that I could have gained more and hurt less, but I guess just... I'm lucky that I did start to see at that point that I like that I that I started to understand and found a path toward learning and per- keeping it from for me ending up back at 350 pounds because stomachs are made of the second stretchiest tissue in the body other than the uterus and I could have easily ended up back at 350 pounds like so many people do they they go right back to their full yeah. weight you know, that would have been possible if it weren't for, for me finding an addiction recovery path. So yes. let's talk a little bit about the surgeries themselves. Everything from the lap band to the gastric bypass to the sleeve to the ruin Y and to the di- to the duodenal switch. Yes. You want yeah, all- thank you. And so before going on, is it all right for me to take a second to just clarify with the listeners that I'm not a doctor or a nutritionist? Sure. My my training is in food addiction coaching. My ideas and thoughts about bariatric surgery and about nutrition and supplementation, please take those as, as opinions and opinions that, or information that's meant to be, if meant to be checked with a doctor before any action is taken on it. But the thing that you offered is that you also have the lived experience of it. I'll try to clarify as we talk, which things are facts that are that I'm bringing to you from scientific studies versus things that are my own personal opinion. So speaking to the types of bariatric surgery and how do they work, medical science is evolving all the time. And we've reached the point now where we have about 10 different types of oh. weight loss surgery procedures. And um, those are broken down into two main categories, ones that are restrictive only. Explain so, what that means and why that's important. Yes, yes. So malabsorption can be added to a stomach reduction surgery by bypassing part of the intestine, by rerouting the intestine in various ways, so that in addition to making the stomach smaller, which is the nature of the restrictive procedures, then these these super procedures that also have a a component, they add that an actual additional very serious aspect where the the person can't access all of the nutrition and therefore all the calories of the food they eat. And that is one of the two ways the the making the stomach smaller 
So going back for just a moment to the restrictive only procedures, those surgeries help people lose weight because they reduce the size of the stomach. And there are really only three operations that fall into that category. So the reduction would be, if we think of a normal stomach as being maybe the size of a grapefruit, uh, we're talking about a reduction maybe to the size of, a, of an orange or a lemon? Yeah, I would say somewhere between probably... Yeah, I would say that's a great that's a great metaphor for okay. the size change. I've heard people say that it's like the size of an egg, but I think that's a little I suppose it it varies from one surgeon to the next. Why wouldn't it? You know yeah. how but in general the range of how of the percentage of stomach size that's reduced is 80 to 85%. Wow. And that's typical for all bariatric surgeries. Is mm-hmm. is Yeah. And if you think about how many Brussels sprouts can you fit into the size of an egg or the size of a small orange, like three or four. But see, because that stomach tissue is the second stretchiest tissue that the human body has, that changes, that that changes over time. And that's a part of the whole, that's part of what the moving parts of this whole experience. So with those restrictive procedures, two of them are really these days, they're minor players and they're not they're not a big part of our conversation. The adjustable lap band actually used to be the most popular of mm-hmm. the restrictive surgery procedures, but in the fullness of time, that's shown to be a failed experiment. And really, there are quite a few of those procedures being undone these days and including being modified to be one of the other more effective procedures. And then there's one other really oddball little surgery that's also very uncommon, which is a gastric balloon, which is meant to be a temporary device. Sounds like a terrible idea to me. And those are really, so neither one of those are are active players in terms of consideration these days. And the the balloon is that you put essentially a balloon-like substance into the stomach. (laughs) Those are not often recommended. If anyone, if anyone listening hears a recommendation for either of those, I hope you will run, not walk to the nearest exit. But you could see why somebody might want to do the gastric band because they think adjustable, it's reversible. Why not try that first? But you're saying that the success rate is not very high. Exactly. Exactly. It's, it just didn't prove to be help. The risk reward ratio just wasn't there and it's become very clear and it's faded to be at some point we'll cross the line where literally more are being undone than done. It's both of those are just little tiny players, very few people recommending them and doing them. You know, the big surgery, the biggest surgery today, the most popular procedure falls in, is the only remaining procedure in that restrictive category, yeah. that restrictive only category. And that's the sleeve gastrectomy, which is, yeah, some exactly sometimes just referred to as a sleeve or sleeve surgery. And so that represents 60% of all the bariatric procedures that are being done worldwide. The gastric sleeve surgery, so it achieves that goal of restriction by surgically reducing the size of the stomach. And what's done, they call it a sleeve, really, because because it almost creates like a banana-shaped pouch Uh out of the stomach. So the it's like a long, narrow tube. Yeah, so instead of instead of a grapefruit, it's a banana. Yes, good point. And so the extra width of it is cut off and thrown away. And so there is no reversing a sleeve surgery, whereas some of the procedures potentially have some option to be reversed, but that is a permanent procedure. And, and there is no intestinal change changing that is part of the sleeve surgery. And I actually personally think it's a really good thing that a non procedure that is not malabsorptive is now the leading procedure because I think the greatest danger in these procedures comes with that additional malabsorptive component that it, it, it adds insult to injury because actually there, there is a lot going on with malabsorption, even in a sleeve surgery, even though they don't tell you that and they don't bill it as a malabsorptive procedure, I will tell you in detail why it is that there, there really are malabsorptive features to that surgery. In other words, there's enough already there without adding like intentional intestinal changes. We we absorb some vitamins through our our stomach and that part of that is probably being inhibited because of it's being cut off that area. Exactly. Exactly. And I'll say more about that in just a bit, but that second category of procedures comprises, let's see, seven different surgeries. And Ruin Y gastric bypass sits smack in the middle of them. And it can really represent that whole 
category of surgeries in our conversation, because there are basically three surgeries with odd names that are a bit less malabsorptive, a bit less of the intestine is rerouted in various ways. And then there are three procedures that are a bit more malabsorptive, maybe for people who are 500 pounds or 600 pounds, where they're, they're, perhaps their risk of immediate imminent death is closer. And so those procedures, but really we can represent the concept and the issues that occur with that category of surgery just by referring to the middleman there, which is Roux and Y gastric bypass. And at the time that I had my surgery, it was described to me as the Cadillac of weight loss procedures Be- because it, d- it it did have, it did then and still does have some greater weight loss benefits down the road than say an, a restrictive only procedure. The ruin why, yeah, it makes basically a small pouch in the stomach. So I guess that's the idea of the lap band making a pouch, but it's a surgical pouch. Re- Part of the intestine that food would normally pass through gets yeah. pulled out of the line that the food travels down. Yes. And, and it's actually a super critical part of the small intestine that is responsible for, for absorbing things that we need so much. Yes, it, it would be absorbing calories at the same time, but it's a very crucial organ that allows us to access the nutrients that we yeah. eat. And that's being you know cut out of the equation. So the small intestine for people, it's basically three parts. There's the duodenum, the jejunum, and the ileum. And the duodenum is like high real estate for absorption, as is the jejunum next. And these surgeries either bypass the duodenum or significantly take a huge part out. Therefore, you're not absorbing a lot of your food. And the the duodenal switch adds the additional piece of having, I think it's a sleeve uh, at first. So there's the restrictive piece. And then there's this rerouting to not very much of that duodenum, which is the high real estate, uh, maybe like three quarters down, and then also cutting out a lot of the jejunum. So it's significantly malabsorption. And that's why the duodenal switch is considered not the Cadillac, but the most extreme. Right. Actually, there's one, there's one that's even more extreme than the duodenal switch. And that is the biotic diversion. Actually take out the head of the pancreas. Oh my God. I know. I know. So thank you for that added detail, because there are quite a few different variations now. So let's start with the good news. And according to the Department of Gastroenterology at UCLA, in a study that they reported 75% of weight loss surgery patients have kept off at least some of the weight they lost after a period of 10 years has passed. So that's at least some, that might be five pounds to get in the, into that 75%. With that one group where 75% of the people have kept off at least some of what they lost, yeah. that weight loss is credited with reducing premature death from diseases that are associated with obesity yeah. and that things like diabetes and yeah. heart disease and even certain cancers are associated with obesity. That is good news, but there's also bad news. And that is the flip side of that very same study from UCLA. If 75% kept off at least some of the weight they lost, that means 25% kept off none of the weight they lost. Mm -hmm. And so think about that for a minute. Those people end up with, they end up no better off than they were before their surgery from a weight standpoint, and they're also likely to be experiencing some degree of nutrient malabsorption. Hmm. Plus, they're also at an increased risk for other health complications and transfer addictions. Hmm. So it's so that that sector of patients that don't do well, there are some we can make it much worse for ourselves by opting for this route if there's a chance or reality of addiction, of actual addiction. So why is it that weight loss surgery works well for some people, but not for others? So it's the reason that weight loss surgery doesn't work well for everyone is that obesity and food addiction are two separate problems. Bariatric surgery can work very well as a treatment for obesity, but it doesn't treat food addiction at all, like not at all. So it makes sense that lots of people who aren't addicted to food are have 
they might get really great results from weight loss surgery, especially if they get motivated and they make lifestyle changes. Maybe those people were just hard users who were never especially motivated to change their ways. And and that this surgery, weight loss surgery for them was enough to curb their appetite and improve, change their habits and improve their motivation. That's why there's a success picture for some people. The issue for food addicts is that food addiction is a brain disease, not a stomach disease, not a digestive system disease. And so to put it simply, operating on someone's stomach doesn't cure their brain, Mm -hmm. period. Mm -hmm. And that's why I believe it's so important for weight loss surgery patients um, to be accurately assessed for food addiction as early as possible if possible, before they've really made a commitment to go down the road of surgery. Because if food addiction doesn't get addressed before before surgery, then or, or at least soon out very soon after, addicted patients are food addicted patients are at an increased risk of overeating until that reduced size stomach is painfully overextended and stretched out potentially permanently. They're at risk of obviously regaining their weight and they're at risk of transferring their addiction to other substances and behaviors. So really it's, there's some very important reasons for these issues to come, you know, forward into the light of the food addiction space. And the weight loss surgery space, for sure. Can we talk about the side effects of weight loss? <laughs> yes, we can. So I really consider malabsorption to be one of two of the worst side effects. That that malabsorption, I personally believe that some malabsorption results from all weight loss surgeries, including sleeve gastrectomy, which is billed as a restrictive only procedure. And I'm going to explain why it is that actually the result of that surgery does include some significant malabsorption. And to start explaining that, I want to ask the question, what were those cells needed for before they were removed? If they're removing, it's 80 to 85%. So I'm going to use the 85% number. If they're removing 85% of our stomachs in all of these surgeries or by, or bypassing them, that 85% of those stomach cells that had purposes in our bodies before they were removed or bypassed, they're not there anymore. What is it that those cells, that tissue was meant to be doing for us? And so there are five types of cells in that tissue that are meant to be accomplishing all kinds of things for us that we actually really need. Parietal cells are a type of cell that are responsible responsible for secreting gastric acid and a substance called intrinsic factor that we need so that we can absorb vitamin B12. Then gastroendothelial cells, they are cells that control the passage of antigens and microbes from our stomach into our bloodstream. And they also pr- help protect us against infections. And they're, they play a role in having in helping us have a peaceful coexistence with our gut microbiome. So then there are the chief cells that are responsible for secreting pepsinogen, which is necessary for protein digestion. So really, you know, what it is that happens when like roughly 80 to 85% of those important cells are removed or bypassed is is malabsorption, that we cannot access either the nutrition that we need or the calories that we would have incurred. And I would question, is it really worth not having those calories to not have that nutrition? And, And there are major downstream consequences to malabsorption. And so malabsorption leads us to potentially to one degree or other of malnutrition. Mm-hmm. And malnutrition is the situation where our body and our brain are actually not getting the fuel that they need, the building blocks and the nutrition that they need to operate effectively. And that can lead to impaired cognition and lots lots of other real problems. And, so, and, and impaired cognition, for example, dementia, if you don't get enough B12, if you don't get enough B1, that causes actual brain impairment. Yes, it yeah. does. It does. And lots of other nutrients affect cognitive function too. And there are lots of nutrients that 
as you can imagine, with especially if the procedure includes that malabsorptive component, yeah. lots of nutrients that that can't be absorbed at the level that they really should be absorbed at. And one of the most really alarming aspects of the implications of malnutrition is that malnutrition can worsen addiction. It can worsen the brain disease of addiction and worsen cravings, and it can either cause or exacerbate other mental health conditions. And this is some of the stuff that most people really don't know, but it's staggering because the nutrients that are poorly absorbed by weight loss surgery patients are the very same ones that are necessary for producing adequate levels of our feel-good neurotransmitters. The same things that we can't get enough of now as bariatric patients are needed for our brain chemistry to work correctly. So protein, huge. It's just huge. There's such a dramatic impact on protein absorption and digestion, more so for the malabsorptive procedures. But mm -hmm. still, with 85% of those of that of those stomach cells gone in in the most popular surgery sleeve, there we cannot access our protein with much less stomach acid and all those things. So check out this shocking statistic, Vera, about mm -hmm. increased suicide among weight loss surgery patients. There have actually been multiple large studies that show suicide and self-harm rates among weight loss surgery patients are two to four times higher than in the general population. That's not 20%, that's or something like that, which would still be bad. 200 to four, two to four times equals a 200% or 400% increase in suicide. You're saying it's actually, we're not getting the essential proteins, the essential amino acids that we need to be able to be happy, to be able to function. Exactly. We don't have the building blocks to make, yeah. to, to generate healthy levels of neurochemicals, literally. Okay. And you had also, I know, wanted to touch on dumping syndrome, yeah. which is, which is a strange, I would say it's much less significant in my opinion than mal than like malnutrition or transfer addiction but it, it is a thing it is it, it can be it can be a, a real problem for people who've had weight loss surgery and I'll describe what it is and it, it's a bigger problem for people who've had that double type surgery that includes the malabsorptive component if yeah. they've had one of those and what happens with dumping syndrome is that food passes food passes into a, a section of the intestine that is not normally meant to receive food in that early stage of digestion. Yeah, so if it be digested, yeah. Yeah. And so if sugars haven't already been pulled out by that portion of the intestine that's been bypassed, this tissue, this intestinal tissue that's meant to be further down the chain it is genetically programmed to freak out if there's sugar in there because it should have been pulled out by the time yeah. it you know by this stomach that's been debilitated and by this other section of intestine that's now removed from the process you know so what it does is it sets off alarm bells it says whoa we have an emergency Houston we have it's like we need to re release a ton of insulin because there's way too much sugar in the system. And so what it, what the pancreas does is release a ton of insulin because yeah. it thinks there's an emergency which drops our blood sugar very quickly. And it's just a really awful feeling of cold sweats and some heart palpitations a little bit and just feeling one of the results of having your blood sugar drop so quickly is that for one thing, having all that insulin rush in puts you in fight or flight mode, yeah. the nervous energy. And when your blood sugar drops that much, you feel instantly like you need to eat everything in sight. It's a biological yeah. imperative to right. just eat, eat something, eat things that are going to turn it around. And so what Which I have- exposes you to food addiction right there. <laughs> yes, it would. But also for people who are already food addicts, what it does is that if they, if they eat something even in, as innocuous as raisins or even too much fruit or whatever at one time, that 
that cycle and that sudden drop in blood sugar, which can also actually be caused by caffeine, by the way, interestingly, but that drop in blood sugar, it can lead to some really bad decisions right then about what is it am I going to eat in this moment when I'm feeling like I absolutely have to eat something. But there's also the nauseousness and people throwing up or having diarrhea, like it's a physical yes. phenomenon as well. That's apparently quite uncomfortable. Yeah, it's just really, it's really unpleasant. It's really disruptive mm-hmm. and it's hard to predict. What, the interesting thing is you can eat the same, someone who's had weight loss surgery can eat the same thing one day. And just because of how their biochemistry is flowing that day, they could have a, a fine reaction to it or a yeah. dumping reaction to yeah. it. Just same food on know, same food, different day. The consequences of bariatric surgery enough that would scare me for sure. Transfer addiction. Thank you. Okay, great. Because I like to say, Say that a food addict having bariatric surgery is a lot like a cocaine addict having 85% of her nostrils sewn shut. So think about that. What's going to happen? Are they going to try to cram that cocaine in there? Are they going to be like, oh, screw it. I'm just going to, I'm just going to drink, or I'm just going to take prescription pain medicine or something off the street. When an addicted, when a brain disease is in place and has that, those processes have begun unless that addiction is treated and driven into remission, basically, it's going to go sideways in some way or other. It might be my, the main thing that I did was just try to overfill my pouch again and again with really horrible results. But I did some drinking of alcohol and there was actually a period of time where I took pain, prescription pain medication that I had in my medicine cabinet because my brain was just screaming for relief. And and thank God, the path to addiction recovery really made it very clear that anything that sort of activates brain reward pathways is something that I needed to lay off of. Can you say anything about alcohol and the increase in alcoholism post bariatric surgery? Why, yes, I can. There is, so there was one study reported in, in the JAMA journal which cited a 50% increase in alcohol use disorder in the second year after Ruin Y gas bypass as compared with the years immediately prior to surgery. 50% Mm -hmm. increase in alcohol use disorder. It's basically because liquid sugar, alcohol is the ultimate liquid sugar. And so that is really the easiest way to get around. If you think about that cocaine addict, it's the easiest way to get that cocaine up in there still. And so it's a staggering statistic and it's a really huge problem. And there are numerous studies that indicate that up to 30% of bariatric patients are going to develop a replacement addiction. And that in many cases, that replacement addiction actually stays in place, even if they regain the weight, Mm. even if they're also suffering from malnutrition and some of the other problems that, you know, that are associated with bariatric surgery. Hey, Food Junkies listeners. We're just going to take a quick break here to share with you something our team thinks could help benefit your recovery with food, body, or self. Thank you again for listening. Hey, Food Junkie listeners. Have you read the book, Food Junkies Recovery from Food Addiction yet? It all starts there. This is the book with the basic theory and clinical knowledge of food addiction. Read this book first to get the basics. Our Food Junkies podcast jumps off from the book and is the ongoing breathing version, ever growing and ever expanding. Our podcast introduces you to all the issues of food addiction and the who's who of food addiction today. And if we at the Food Junkies podcast have inspired you to action, either to quit sugar or some other triggering foods or behavior, and you need some extra support, then please join the free Facebook group, I'm Sweet Enough Sugar Free for Life. There you will find a community of people who come from all parts of the spectrum, from the new and just starting out, to the long timers who call themselves food addicts in recovery, to counselors ready to give back and help you. The Facebook group even offers free support Zoom groups. Basically, it's a great online living resource of food addiction to help you stay sugar-free for life. So please join us. Now back to the show. If you have enjoyed this episode, please let us know. We love to hear from you. 
kindly leave us a review on whatever platform you listen to our podcast on. We love getting feedback from our listeners. Okay, so that's where you come in with your clinic. And so basically, tell us what you do in response to this dilemma that you've just explained so eloquently. It's quite fascinating. I think it is so fascinating. And okay, I consider myself like to work with two populations, either people who have reached the late stage of addiction. I'm happy to help those people because they really need, in my view, every tool that we can bring to them. And that's the stage of addiction that I have reached. And then also people who've had bariatric surgery. So those are really the two populations that I like to work with. And the, But the first step um, of helping people is to really resolve that question of, are they addicted? Are they addicted to food? So for anyone who doesn't have uh, 100% clarity on whether they are addicted to food or not, the place that I start with them is to do a comprehensive assessment of whether or not they are addicted. And I use, as you mentioned in the intro, yeah, yeah I use the sugar assessment and it really makes it crystal clear. There's, It takes the guesswork out, out of it. And so for people who are who don't test as addicted, or, or maybe perhaps they're in the early stages and they haven't had weight loss surgery, I refer those patients or those clients to other treatment organizations. And thank God we have more and more of those emerging these days, more choices geared to different people and different needs. If it turns out that they that the, the person is late stage and or a weight loss surgery client or someone who's considering weight loss yeah. surgery, because to me, if you're thinking about having weight loss surgery, it's really critical to have a very comprehensive program put into place to see if you can prevent that being necessary. The, the you, you surgery. Know. Yeah, you yeah. might even be able to, to avoid the surgery. Exactly. And that's absolutely my recommendation, if at all possible. And yeah. so that that is another like special category. If, if they're seriously thinking about it, let's make sure that they get like a full support program that is very comprehensive because it's so pivotal if they go down that road of surgery. It's the, ampl the, the health implications are just so significant that you would want to have done a great job of seeing if there's any way to avoid it. For patients, for clients that really then prove to be appropriate for the kind of care that I offer, I work with those people on an individual basis. I, I do plan at some point to implement some group programs, but for right now, I'm doing deep dive work with people on a daily basis. So like my program is offered on, on a monthly basis and we work together daily. And that includes making recommendations for an eating plan that is at least low carb and hopefully the closer to ketogenic that I can interest that person in trying the better. And when I say rec recommending, since I had mentioned that I'm not a nutritionist yeah. or a doctor, I'm putting forward a recommendation that they, they, they then check with their own nutritionist or their own doctor. And I can dialogue with those people. So yeah. it really starts with an eating plan. It starts with a very thorough investigation of what trigger foods and ingredients are activating that person. And so the person walks into bariatric breakthrough, your program and says, I'm thinking about doing uh, bariatric surgery. And then you're going to assess, are they a food addict as well? It's a pretty high chance that there is some level of food addiction involved, either minor to more major. And you're going to address that. I'm with you so far, right? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. And then you're suggesting the keto plan. What about the plant-based? Does it have to be keto? Actually, or? keto isn't necessarily animal-based. Keto is, uh. is just refers to the level of carbohydrates in the eating plan. And the problem with plant-based, as you well know, is that it's really hard to eliminate enough starch and carbohydrate from a plant-based diet to reduce the carbohydrates sufficiently to be low carb and definitely to be keto. It's just really hard because those plant-based proteins, for example, they come hand in hand with yeah. a lot of starch. Yeah. So okay. you, you got the food plan, you're going to call them and talk to them every day. I think we were talking about to identify all the triggers that you want to remove. Exactly. And that really actually takes a lot of honesty. People don't, we don't want to give up those things that, that, 
reward us so much. And just to clarify, it's not by phone that I work with people every day. I, it's text is texting every day is the daily in a uh, form of interaction and zooming weekly is the weekly method for working with clients. So yes, that really thorough investigation of, of what, you know, all the things that really might be triggering. And sometimes it's a process for people to become willing to let them go. And then, so in addition to that uh, components, these aren't necessarily in, in any given order, but other components of the program. So, and I do want to clarify that even though I work with people individually, support is an imperative part of, of any good treatment program. And so part of my guidance is, and is guidance and accountability actually for participating actively in one or more peer support groups. Right. There's some teaching about how they differ and their pros and cons, and even some nuts and bolts, meeting information and contact information, that sort of thing. But so I don't want to give the impression Bam. that any good treatment program can be without a group component because so, I don't bl believe that's so, so basically you've got the food plan, you've got the kind of food coaching elements of it. And then uh, you whisk them off into surgery if that's where they're going. So that would be the pre-bariatric now post-bariatric oh no no no! i'm not no. whisking anyone off no. okay to surgery no, I'm <laughs> whisking. they've already made the decision they're going to go no i know i i get it you're gonna okay yeah. okay okay there there have been some clients that are on that path and they just want to they want to also address their food addiction even if yeah. they hear me saying that they may well be able to, to get well without the surgery yes. and yes. there there have been so yeah and but that's not the typical situation is they've either not yet decided and they want to see if they can avoid it or they've had it and however far out from their surgery, they are now understanding that they have uh, uh, a, a disease that isn't addressed at all right. by the surgery that they had. Uh -oh, so there's other side of this. So uh, pre-surgery, it's trying to see if you can avoid the surgery in the first place by having yes. a solid food addiction plan. And then post-surgery, it's the diet or the food plan is also to address all the nutritional deficiencies and also the food addiction so they don't regain. And so it's not just the food plan that addresses the nutritional deficiencies, yeah. particularly. So in my opinion, what's going on with late stage people is also very much a function of malnutrition, of brain chemistry malnutrition. And wow. that there I have seen a very obvious association between even people that haven't had weight loss surgery, giving them nutritional supplementation, the vitamins, the minerals, and the amino acids, that combination of nutrients that are, and protein, plenty of protein in their diet. Those are the building blocks that we need to have enough, to have the ability to create adequate levels of our feel good neurotransmitters. Which is essentially why we need to do a, a higher protein, low carb food plan, because you've got to get those nutrients in there. Yes, yeah. precisely, Vera, that you're on the mark with that. Absolutely. And so there are really two, there are really two levels of nutritional supplementation for weight loss clients. We're just looking across the board at the one at the nutrients that are known um, that are known to be malabsorbed. Interestingly, it's issues with deficiencies of those same nutrients that lead to heightened levels of cravings in late stage food addicts. And I do this really detailed um, symptom tracking with my clients. Are they are they supplementing vitamins and minerals? And you look at the association between their symptom, changes in their symptoms and changes in their supplementation. And sort of the higher level of supplementation includes amino acids that are the building blocks of protein. They're what protein is broken down into in our bodies so that we can use it in various ways. Most importantly, really for brain function and for our brain chemistry to be operating correctly and for us to feel good and to have manageable levels of cravings, to reduce unmanageable cravings. Thank you. That's so interesting. Now we're running out of time. So I have a couple more questions. Sure. You had mentioned something um, about the rates of uh, food addiction in the bariatric community. I'd be very interested to know that, especially post-bariatric, if you have that. So let's give the context that Ashley Gearhart has just uh, come out with a figure of about 15% of the population are food addicted. What can you say in relation to the bariatric community? Ah, okay. So in relation to the bariatric community, there was a study that was published in the Journal of Obesity Surgery in 2016 that 
uh, reported that 26% of weight wow. loss surgery patients meet the clinical criteria for food addiction. And actually, I thought that was a bit of a low estimate because I've heard I've heard it estimated that something along the lines of 20% of the general population uh, Mm. is addicted to food. And so I would have uh, imagined that percentage among weight loss surgery patients could have been a bit higher. But yeah, that one study did say, but nonetheless, you certainly see that 25% that regain all of their weight, 26 and 25, those pieces you know, but what about those pieces, the people that that maybe only kept off 10 pounds? They, there might be some food addiction going on for them as well. So in other words, it's a very significant percentage of the population of people who are in bariatric surgery. And the thing is that most of those folks don't know that they're addicted to food. They don't know that uh, food addiction is a progressive disease that's going to continue to develop. There's a real critical lack of information out there about how addiction inter- interacts with that remedy, this surgical remedy. Okay. And now I wanted to make sure we asked about the GLP-1s. Yeah, basically in the medical world, the bariatric world, weight loss surgery was considered the gold standard of care because it, as you've described, gave quick results within a quick period, like significant results within a quick period of time. But now the GLP-1s are showing that these this amazing weight loss within also six months, not equivalent to 50%, but some the promises are now almost 30%. And without surgery, that's pretty good. So the gold standard might change over time to becoming weight loss medications. So what's your take on the GLP-1s? Oh, thank you for asking that. It really is a fascinating emerging trend right now yeah. and remedy that people are making use of. But I'm going to admit that I personally am am somewhat skeptical about that direction, and I'll tell you why. So it's been well established that there's roughly a two-year grace period with weight loss surgeries where even food addicts have this reprieve where they're not crazy with food addiction. Yes. And I would I would bet my nickel that uh, when enough time has passed that we are going to see that there's a similar grace period with GLP-1 medications. And that's because of the phenomenon of tolerance. I really believe that there's trouble coming. And it's basically, my prediction is that those medications are going to be working less and less well, even if people take more and more of them. And that what they're gonna, the situation they're gonna find themselves in is that if they didn't use that honeymoon phase, if they didn't use that time well to build, to change habits and treat addiction, if addiction was a component of what was going on, they're going to find in in all too many cases that they have lost muscle mass, that it's even harder for them to feel that satiety, that ever elusive satiety, if they decide to ditch the GLP-1 medications because they weren't, they just were hardly doing anything and they became not worth it. And other, they, people can really potentially end up worse off afterwards, after perhaps a period of time when they were greatly improved. And yeah. I just think that powerful force of tolerance is going to play a factor. And I would much rather see people address if there is addiction, if there's addiction in the equation to, to just, yeah, yeah, to just yeah. see them address that. Yeah. We're on the same page there because it, it, just for our listeners, the body has a fundamental principle. It's called homeostasis. It always wants to go back to the set point as it were. And so exactly. when, we, when we take a drug that pushes us out ahead of that, we will catch up. The body will catch up and bring us back. And so the tolerance develops. It happens everything in everywhere. And it, how can it not happen with GLP ones? And so I agree with you completely that we need to use that two year honeymoon window period to learn those tools, but that's it. It's a bridge only. It sounds like we are on the same page. Yes. Yes, we are. I don't actually especially recommend it as a bridge. If, if someone's really determined to, to use it, that would be, that would be its function, but I would, I'd really rather see them not start to use that. Okay. So I think we we should close off a little bit now. Do you have any last thoughts about what you'd like to say to somebody who's listening, who's thinking, "Eh, I wonder if I should pursue bariatric surgery, some final statement that you want to make something for somebody to think about? Yes. Thank you for the opportunity to try to, to sum it up. And I would just hope for anyone that's considering weight loss surgery of any kind to really make sure that they have have been assessed, a comprehensive assessment to determine if 
food addiction is at play in, in, at some level, whether it's early stage, middle or late. And that is because People can have the wrong expectation of weight loss surgery. Weight loss surgery will be helpful for weight loss, but it will not help you at all if food addiction is a component of what you're experiencing. And food addiction, if it continues, is going to drive weight problems in most cases. So in other words, and also to just be aware that there are some very serious prices to pay for the benefits, for the benefits that, that, that surgery offers. And really had I known what was involved, I would not have, I would undo it. I would not do it. And so I'd really love to see people, people be treated for their food addiction and let the weight resolve itself. Yeah. So food addiction treatment, you can lose the same amount of weight or more without the consequences and with the, and with long-term effects. Yes. Yes. Okay. We always ask as a final question, the signature question, if you could tell a younger version of yourself something about bariatric surgery, what would it be? And for that, I would say- Or food addiction. um, Or food addiction. Okay, great. Because actually it is food addiction that I want to speak to. Okay. That I used to think there were really only two options. In my life, I was either always dying to eat everything in sight or I was dying from eating everything in sight. There was, those were the only two options. And when people, when people cajoled and encouraged me to you know, lose weight and to, I, I thought that they were basically saying white knuckle it forever. Like it's going to suck for you forever. And I just thought if I do that, that's what my future would be. Like I really, because food addiction started for me right away, I actually literally could not conceive of there being a third option of peace and actually not wanting to hurt myself with food, like not even wanting to. And literally that was something that I could not imagine. And I, it hadn't occurred to me that it existed until I heard people talking about it. And I started to think, why would these people be saying that if it weren't true? And that's really the message that helped me decide, okay, I'm going to try, I'm really going to take the leap of faith here and do some scary stuff and try to live without this substance that I feel like I desperately need. And it worked and it did work. There is a third option. The third option is real recovery, actual neutrality around food, peace from, from craving. And, and what I would tell a younger version of myself is that it's going to, it's possible and it's worth it. All right. Thank you. That's a great way to end our talk. Thank you so much, Julie. You gave a really compelling story of what it's like to live before. And we learned a lot about bariatric surgery, which I really appreciate our listeners to hear, and that there is a solution. And some of your reservations about the current solutions. Overall, I thought this was a great talk. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Vera Tarman, for all your work in the field. Thank you. Thanks for joining us this week on Food Junkies, Recovery from Food Addiction. Make sure to join our Facebook group, Sugar Free for Life Support Group, I'm Sweet Enough. You can subscribe to our show in iTunes or Stitchers. That way you'll never miss an episode. While you're at it, if you found value in this show, we'd appreciate a rating on iTunes. Or if you'd simply tell a friend about the show, that would help us out too. Don't forget to pick up your copy of Dr. Tarman's book, Food Junkies, which is available on Amazon. If you have any additional questions, both Molly and Clarissa are food addiction professionals and work one-on-one with clients. You can find their websites and email addresses in the show notes. Be sure to tune in every Friday when our new episodes drop. As Vera loves to say, the power is ours.